Wow. I, uh, I wish I hadn't said that to him. Um, yeah, what I was talking about before I came up is that uh, this year was the third Black Hat talk I did. This is my first at DEF CON, and I'm a thousand times more nervous about this. Um, you know, uh, I've been coming since uh, about DC 10, and I'm always amazed here. I always learn so much, um, and I'm really honored and really stoked and really amazed to be standing up here and a little freaked out, so I'll do my best. Sorry for the black hat slides. I suck. I was going to put DC logos, and I was up way too late last night. Sorry. So who am I? Um, I'm a security consultant, uh, which means that I deal with a lot of people who get owned. That's kind of a lot of the job, if you do this stuff for a living. Um, I work for a company called Speartip Technologies, which is in uh, St. Louis. We do forensics a lot. We do incident response a lot. Uh, so, like I say, deal with people who get owned a lot. And weddings, funerals, bar mitzvahs. I like unsolvable problems, so to me, defense is a little more interesting. Um, you know, I have to deal with the other side, too. I think, you know, people who, are, who really understand this stuff understand that, like, the sort of binary distinction is uh, a little bit uh, simplistic. So, my hat color is fuchsia. Um, something that I want to say here, I've talked to a lot of... Uh, especially in the past couple of days, a lot of people who develop exploits, a lot of really elite, really, really smart, really, really awesome people. I'm not one of those people. Um, this is my attempt to understand this topic as a normal human. So uh, the picture of me right there, actually, just to maybe uh, help you out with that, is uh, me running the New York Marathon. And I finished kind of somewhere in the bottom third. And this has been kind of a marathon, too, of sort of my attempt to understand this stuff. And hopefully I'll kind of come a little closer to the middle of the pack. We'll see. Uh, so yeah, I mean, basically like right now with Vista, uh, you know, we're really getting Mike Howard and these guys shouting from the rooftops that, you know, buffer overflow, zero days, you know, that there's going to be a lot of new stuff that's supposed to make this stuff a lot harder to do. Um, you know, for me, it seems like we're in kind of a flailing death loop in the security business of patches and signatures for sale on a subscription basis, and things never really seem to get any better. Um, did anybody go to Bruce Potter's talk? Is that been yet? Yeah, I mean, basically, you know, to me, the security industry is kind of a racket. Um, they really don't have an interest in making anything any better in the long term or really getting to the root of the problem. So this is kind of, for one very specific kind of attack vector, uh, this is kind of my attempt to understand kind of the root of the problem. So. So basically what we're talking about, I get asked by a lot of people, like, what's your talk on? And I'm like, oh, shit. ASLR, new exec stacks, pro police, um, canaries, uh, access control models. And uh, so it seems like the prevailing term that seems to make sense is exploit mitigation. Um, that seems to be kind of a you know pretty easy way to describe what this stuff is. Uh, so it's a range of compiler, OS features, library features uh, that intend to make successful compromise a little more difficult. Um, one of the kind of the main aims and, uh, you know, really that's kind of what a lot of this stuff is about is to make mass exploitation a little, a little less difficult. It isn't necessarily something that's going to protect a, you know, concerted effort to go after a unique, you know, a single system, but it does kind of make things that are sort of reusable a little harder to do. Um, and then, you know, sort of fundamentally a lot of this is about limiting uh, our exposure from overall kind of memory corruption based attacks, which is kind of a blanket term to describe, you know, stack based overflows, heap overflows, return to libc, all the, you know, kind of all this stuff. So, yeah, so we're pretty much talking about no exec stacks, ASLR, canaries, um, some compile time stuff. A lot of these things are compiler extensions. And I'm going to talk about a couple other kind of containment models too. Yeah, so again, if you're elite, you're in the wrong room. Go somewhere else. Let the humans and the normals talk for a little bit, you know? Um, this is uh, basically just my attempt to understand this stuff and uh, some of the implications, you know, that are out there. And, you know, like I say, this is something I kind of got interested in about six months ago. Um, what got me kind of on it was, uh, and I, I talk about this a little bit in the paper, was uh, working a big yellow outbreak and uh, 
looking at that and a couple other recent Windows exploits where it was like, well, wait a minute, aren't they telling us that you know this is all fixed now? We've got the GS extensions to Visual Studio and all that, and um, you know this is supposed to be solved. We've got depth, you know, um, so that we're all supposed to be safe. It's all supposed to be so much better. So just to kind of like rewind way back, and this has been my attempt to understand this stuff. Okay, like ten people know who these guys are at least, right? Anyone? Bueller? No? Or I'm just not cool enough to. Did somebody say it? Yeah, it's uh, it's actually I looked for K and R. I couldn't find a picture of K and R together. So this is Thompson and Richie. Um, sorry. So, uh, but you're close. You get a cookie. Um, the uh, yeah, and I think Richie is the guy with the Phil Collins kind of hair, you know, with the bald on top deal. Uh, but you know, I mean, I think something fundamentally to this whole kind of problem, and you know, there's uh, on uh, if you read Joanna Rakowska's blog, there's uh, there's a uh, entry there talking about you know game over, like how do you how do you get past this stuff in a fundamental way? And I think kind of the prevailing uh, thought is that we really need to change the computing model and kind of look at some new like different ways to approach this. Uh, but you know, K and R when they were designing this stuff. Uh, your adversary, your attacker, that's the guy at the other teletype, right? So you can elbow him and say, hey, cut it out, dude. You know. So now it's, a, it's an entirely different model from what they ever expected things to be. And you know, so fundamentally, the class of bugs has been around you know, longer than you know, probably almost everyone in this room. Um, you know, at least the 19, since the 1960s, we've kind of understood some of this stuff in terms of high-level languages and how they deal with things. It is something that's kind of intrinsic to the von Neumann model. So von Neumann uh, kind of created the data code abstraction. So when you are back in uh, the early, he was a Manhattan Project guy and he was involved in like uh, UNIVAC and some of these things. And on the early, early systems to get new code, you had to resolder, right? I mean, that's how it worked. And that was uh, less an elegant way to do things. So von Neumann kind of came up with the data code abstraction. So you have, you know, code and you have instructions and then you have data, and it's the breaking of that membrane between the two that is what a lot of this stuff is about. So yeah, some of the cool. I, you know, I always like Fandango on Core. I don't know why they didn't take off. You know, like MSO five forty six Fandango on Core and ISS or IS. You know, would be kind of neat, but everybody kind of went for buffer overflows. And it's a less than perfect term, and if you talk to a lot of people, they'll talk about the specifics that it's, you know, it's not the best definition, but it seems to be what we all kind of use to refer to it. So in trying to go back and, like, understand, like, how far back kind of this stuff goes, the, the Morris worm uh, was uh, one of the vectors that Morris used to spread was a stack-based overflow in Finger D in the gets call. And it's actually bug ID number two on security focus. Uh, bug ID one was sendmail debug, which was like the other vector. And it's like, yeah, OK, sendmail bug, first one in bug track. Makes sense. Cool. OK. Um, and, and here's what's interesting. In, in uh, Gene Spafford's analysis of it, he says that uh, you know the lack of balance checking in C, uh, the gets call and the scanf call, um, you know, and some of the other unsafe calls in C should be avoided. So the answer is, yeah, we've we known about this for about 19 years at least that somebody's quantified it and said, hey, fundamentally, this is a problem. Um, so between Morris, uh, there, was, uh, there were a lot of system vulnerabilities back then that were not that complex. They were things like really bad coding, you know, stuff like uh, you know, entering, entering bad input. I think there's like a vax bug where it's like hitting enter a couple times or something drops you into a login. Like silly stuff like that, so things got a little better on the basic stuff. Uh, in about '95, Thomas Lepatic uh, found a uh, stack-based overflow, posted it to Bug Track in, in the NCSA HTBD. And what was kind of cool for me about it was he said, "Hey, this looks like the Morris worm bug. You know, this is the same thing." And th the thing I guess I would say about Lepatic was the reason that was so much more interesting, right? Was that it was this, we were just starting to begin the commercial internet and all the interconnectivity and all these other connections between different networks. And it was like a whole different problem then, right? And it's a problem we're, you know, we're all sort of getting our brains around still, right? So uh, Mudge wrote a paper in 95 that was kind of like one of the first ones, actually does predate LF1. Um, it's really like kind of like scratched on the back of a napkin, but it, you know, he describes it as a note to himself, but it's how to write buffer overflows. You can find it out on, you know, if you're a uh, antiquarian like I am, you can find it in a lot of places. 
So, and then Aleph one, uh, obviously has. Well, I already asked the elite people to leave, but how many people here have read Smashing the Stack? Is that is it a qualify as elite? Wow. Oh shit. <laughs> So, like I say, um, this is just my attempt to understand. I read it like a long, long time ago, and then kind of got into, I, like I say, kind of talk about this in the paper, but uh, I got into the security industry, you know, um, for good or bad. Um, you know, so honestly, like most people in that business, with the exception of the really cool, really elite people here, um, I'm not uh, writing exploits. I kind of got my hand around it a little bit, kind of started to understand it, and then I circled back to it like about six months ago, and I was like, okay, I'm, I've learned a little bit. I kind of understand it a little better now. But, um, you know, he talks about memory segments, talks about the layout of the stack. It's always a good place to start. Um, and, you know, the data code abstraction, um, you know, kind of really started to fine tune and describe like creating shell code, some of this kind of stuff. Then uh, Solar Designer. Uh, in 97, just a little bit, you know, around the same time, there was a lot of activity in kind of understanding this problem around them. Uh, talked about return to libc because he had authored a patch. There was no exec, no exec patch for Linux kernel. Um, and he said, hey, wait a minute, you know, I broke my own stuff. Uh, you know, here's a whole other kind of method, which is just basically preloaded functions, libraries, and things like that in memory. So, and then 99, the woo woo guys. Uh, you know, the uh, Woo Woo on Heap Overflows paper was kind of one of the first really detailed papers on Heap Overflows. There were some other ones uh, around the same time. So if anybody wrote them, like, don't mean to not give credit. Uh, but kind of the same thing, you know, talking about that the Heap is another method. It's another area of memory. And so when you're talking about overriding memory, memory corruption vulnerabilities, there's, you know, there's basically kind of the, really the kind of the three main targets that you're talking about are preloaded functions. Uh, doing execution on the stack or writing to the heap. So, okay, so I, like, I could talk about this the whole time and maybe you'd all fall asleep. To me, it, it's kind of interesting stuff, the kind of the history of all this. Um, but kind of the point is that the approaches kind of have evolved um, and, you know, there is a lot of, a lot more complexity to this, but sort of fundamentally, you've got two or three places that you're targeting and that's kind of what this is about. The vectors, um, you know, kind of are the same for exploitation. So, this is a National Vulner Vulnerability Database Remote Buffer Overflows. So, just remote, no locals, um, up to 06, because that was kind of the end of the year. And there are some questions about the stats they use. You know, they count different Linux distributions separately and all of that. But you know, fundamentally, I mean, this has continued to be a problem. It's continued to be a bigger problem. You know, and I guess for me, you know, the reason I'm, you know, I really would like to see us start to concentrate on, you know, some of the other problems out there in terms of, you know, end users, desktops, um, you know, the client end and all these other areas. And it's like we're still stuck in this, like, 90s loop, you know. So this is, you know, this is old stuff. And in fact, actually, like, I find when I talk to people that, that work on this stuff, it's kind of boring anymore. Like, oh, network, you know, network-based, you know, overflows. That's dull, you know. Um, but it still goes on. It's still a very common method of exploitation. Um, and we still see lots of bugs in it. So, so you know, at a, a very, very high level, and again, this is just my attempt to, to understand these things, what you've got is unexpected input, an unchecked allocation of memory somewhere. You write to the stack, you write to the heap, you call preloaded functions, you move execution to that, and you end up with control of execution flow. I mean, that's, that's sort of fundamentally. And the best way I ever had it described to me, like, uh, Oh, quite a while ago was, you know, 10 pounds of crap in a five pound bag, you know, so you, you've allocated to memory and then there's more input than was expected. So kind of the first place that things went in terms of dealing with this stuff uh, was, uh, you know, the uh, no exec stack stuff, which is sort of saying back on like the Von Neumann stuff, there's a data layer, there's a code layer, there's data segments, code segments, you know, so let's keep them separate. So, so the, uh, you know, basic kind of concept of a no exec stack implementation is that you have a data buffer where you take input uh, from programs and, and allocated memory that you're using uh, and you make that segment kind of read write uh, and then you have code segments that are that are read execute so just you know keep them separate so the uh, Solaris stuff and this is you know, what's funny to me is I used to do a lot of Solaris hardening and Solaris work like a lot of years ago and people used to say, oh, you know, we're so cool on, on Sun because we've got the no exact bit, you know, and, 
you know, the truth is that it, it really did almost no good. I mean, it's been described as a speed bump, you know, by itself. But, uh, you know, that was kind of one of the first implementations. And then, uh, you know, nowadays we kind of circle back to that uh, on the, the uh, AMD64 platform. And specifically, it actually is its page address extensions, which give you a more kind of granular paging model in memory. Um, and there's a, there's a bit that's uh, bit 63, then you set to 0 or 1 for a given page, and that kind of sets the execute bit. Um, something that is pretty important, and we'll get to it in, here in a little bit, is that uh, by itself, the CPU is not doing anything. Uh, you have to have operating system hooks into it, and the implementation of how you hook into that uh, is pretty important in terms of how sound it works as a, as a uh, protection mechanism. So the CPU itself is not doing squat. You know, if you don't have hooks into it, it's, it's just sitting there. So, and then on the emulation software stuff, uh, Solar, the NoExec stack patch stuff, the stack patch for Linux was kind of the first stuff. Uh, OpenBSD is done the WXRX stuff. Uh, Exec Shield is Red Hat's implementation packs, which is very cool. Um, and then on Windows, you've got the dynamic execution prevention, right? And uh, I guess on 64 versus 32, you're really typically on a 32-bit platform, it, it's, it's really just in software. Um, so what you're really doing there is just kind of drawing a line in the sand and saying this sort of section of memory, this segment, and you know they divided depending on the implementation, they divide it in different places. But it's saying this area of memory is for data, this area is for code. Um, one of the things about no exec stacks, and I have a friend who's a Java developer, and he always gets annoyed with me when I talk about this and that I'm interested in it because he's you know on, in Java this is what you do all day long is uh, create code on the stack. Uh, and that's what a JIT compiler and things like that do is they actually break the model. You know, that's by definition, that's what you're doing. Uh, so one of the things about that is that the op different operating systems have had to have a mechanism somehow to exempt those things uh, and allow them to not sort of play by the rules. So with the no exec stack, the vulnerability is still there. Uh, and like we kind of talked about heap and return to libc and things like that. You've just sort of reduced what's possible. So probably the most important thing is return to libc. Um, you uh, basically call a pre-existing function to memory, something else that's loaded. Just the, the reason it, called, it gets called return to libc is that libc includes a lot of common calls that will allow you uh, to exec commands or, or things like that. System bin sh was like always the example in some of the early stuff. Uh, most of the things that talk about you know breaking out of NX sort of come down to this. Another uh, another kind of method for this is to call the mProtect function, which allows you to say this for this chunk of memory, don't make it, uh, don't sort of apply the protection. So you're exempting yourself out with mProtect. And uh, we'll talk about some testing tools later, but basically, if you have the ability to call the virtual protect function, the mProtect function, these sort of allow you to exempt. A given a given uh, chunk of memory from all the restrictions. So, uh, return to libc does require you to have a known address. We'll talk about some of that later. Heap-based overflows. Uh, you know the uh, like I say the uh, libc is not the only the only target. Stack is not the only target. Uh, Heap-based stuff is is kind of seems like lately of more interest. And did anybody see Alice's talk, the DL Malik talk? It's after me. Oh yeah, shit. Okay, he's he's like way cooler. So the elite people can come back then. Um, so yeah, so stay here, stay here. <laughs> I actually want to ask him about something I'm going to get to here in a little bit in terms of heat-based stuff. Um, something else is uh, Piramposa Embody uh, came up with uh, what they sort of call multi-stage overflow. So the idea is, you know, when you do a no exec stack, it's a very specific set of conditions. Uh, that you're protecting against, which is basically like, say, sort of data jumping over to code. And so what you can do in, in the case of theirs is you overwrite a function pointer first, and you point to an address, and then you load uh, shellcode at that predefined address later. And so you didn't break the model necessarily. So you didn't jump from data to code. So it's still a method to, to circumvent that. Escape and Skywing, and this is kind of interesting to me. Um, have a paper, it's, it's from a, maybe a couple years ago, talking about MS's DEP, 
uh, protection. A lot of people were interested in that when it sort of first came out. Um, DEP is configurable in the case of MX, uh, MS's stuff. Remember, we were talking about how JIT compilers and things require the ability to construct code on the stack, so you have to find ways to exempt them out of the model. So what MS does is use process execute flags. Well, what Skaven Skywing found was that there's a, uh, there's a value there, um, mem execute option enable disable. So if you flip that bit, you've just allowed yourself stack execution, and so then you can pop back in. So pop back through that and sort of opt out of that. So one of the things they talk about in there is setting the no execute bit is always on. In the boot I and I, it'll break a whole lot of stuff, unfortunately. Uh, but that, on especially on systems that don't have sort of all the other protections, so like 2003 and XP, uh, this is probably the best you can get is to set it to always on. If it's set for opt out or it's set for opt in, uh, it's kind of moot. They're basically the same thing it, in terms of the fact that you can set that, set those bits and, and like say jump out of the model. It doesn't matter. PAX uses uh, an ELF header and lets you set bits on a file and say like this file is blessed to do this by itself and I, I think maybe that might be a higher bar than sort of doing it in memory at load time. Um, one of the probably biggest problems with all of this stuff, not just actually no exec stacks, but the whole thing is that this is an opt-in, opt-out model. Um, you can pass flags to the compiler to opt out of it. You can uh, find yourself disabling it when you set optimized flags and things like that. So you have to be really careful, read your compiler documentation and things like that and understand exactly what you're doing. Uh, it's pretty easy to, to turn this stuff off without realizing that that's what you've done. Um, and then there's other mechanisms that allow people to opt out. Skywing has on his site, if you if you check this out, the no exec hall of shame. Uh, it talks about a lot of apps that break whenever you have stack execution turned off 100%. Uh, me personally, like running that uh, with that bit set, you know, Firefox, Acrobat, Java, you know, will just barf and they'll shut off, and then you have to sort them back up. Um, this is something that I thought was kind of interesting. I used to use an app called Secure Stack, which is a uh, no exec stack, stack implementation a long time ago that actually ran on, on like NT4 and, and Windows 2000 uh, before they had anything else for that. And uh, I was doing uh, a large network that had a bunch of Veritas backup exec clients set up, and uh, this admin was pushing this update. Uh, they have some kind of ability to hot patch like the, dri the, the drivers and the services that you can like push update client now you know from the admin console and it like pushes us out and every time <laughs> every time you ran that it would crash because secure stack was saying no you can't execute on the stack um, and then you know a couple of years later uh, you had some stack based overflows in, in backup exec so you know maybe it was shutting it off for a reason uh, you know somebody more qualified than me could probably say that so Sort of the next step was to uh, to check for memory corruption um, around the same time that that overflows and sort of all of this stuff was kind of very common uh, as the as a exploit vector. Uh, around that same time, uh, Chris McCowan, who has a talk tomorrow, I think, um, and the uh, the guys from in Munich uh, developed StackGuard, which was kind of an early implementation of the Canary approach. And so basically what you're doing is, for the return address, you're setting a canary value in the stack. And this, uh, if this value is changed, that means that you've overwritten memory. So in function prolog at startup, you st sort of stamp it with this, uh, with this canary word. And then at function epilog, if that value is no longer there, then you call exit. And actually they called different calls through the different implementations of it. But fundamentally, you're shutting off if the canary value changed. So like say it's kind of tripwire for your stack is the way I sort of, for me, understood it. Um, later versions of StackGuard kind of added uh, different ways to do the canary stuff. There's been, there were a number of different papers that talked about problems in the way they did canaries. So the uh, they tried a whole, bu whole bunch of different approaches. Um, and we'll get to actually Propolis, which is probably more interesting because it's more common these days and probably the most widely accepted approach for this. So yeah, Propolis is actually uh, what was integrated into GCC 4.1 uh, pretty recently. Um, the uh, OpenBSD guys did a lot of work a few years ago backporting it for the 3x GCCs. Um, 
it was embraced and extended by MS as the slash GS compiler flags. From what I understand, uh, the latest version of Visual Studio is a lot closer to a full-blown Propolis implementation. The early stuff that they did was was just kind of uh, kind of a sort of a kind of I don't want to say half fast um, kind of a, a step into implementing that. Uh, the in the uh, like I said, the GS cookie in uh, Visual Studio is kind of the same thing as the Propolis guard value. And yeah, Hiroki likes to call it guard values, stack guards, canaries, you know, and he, he, he says it's a guard value, and he wrote it, so I'm going to take his word. Um, it is a, it's an XOR of the, of the uh, pointer and a random value, and then you store those somewhere off the stack. Um, he moved beyond the return address, so you have uh, sort of all registers. Um, we'll get to that in a minute about, about stack guard, but one of the things that it did, especially initially, was just protect the return address. Um, variables and arrays at the bottom, arguments at the top. Something that helped me understand Propolis is, uh, you know, um, you know whether I'm a, an exploit writer or, or any of those things, I, I consider myself a hacker, so I don't like anything with police in it. So, you know, it kind of made me cringe when I read the name of it. Uh, but uh, Propolis is actually what um, bees use to construct their hives. And so it's the outside of the hives. And so really what he was using in, the, in uh, naming it that was describing sort of a well-ordered stack and, and a well-ordered address space and memory. And so that, that helped me understand it a lot better and I felt more comfortable about the name. Then. But uh, what uh, Propolis does, and this is totally ripped from a slide that Hiroki did at Cansec West, so if you go get his slides, they're like way cooler than mine. But uh, you're taking some of the more commonly overflowed buffers, so arguments are typically things that you're going to see uh, arrays that are things that are pushed in and tend to be places where buffer overflows are, you know, where you're inserting data. And he laid out the stack in, in sort of a cleaner way than what you would typically have. So in inserting data into the stack and, and overwriting a memory segment, typically what overflows do is to overwrite both the array the buffer and then the return address. So you kind of have to, in order to do that, they have to be sort of adjacent. So by laying it out in a, in a better layout, it makes it substantially more difficult to exploit stack-based overflows. Um, so that was, to me, that was more important about Propolis than maybe the guard values. Um, you know, that's why I think it developed a lot wider adoption than, than stack guard because it was a sort of a, a move to a whole kind of a better model, a better approach. Um, so kind of an interlude to Canaries which relates to the Atlas, so I'll, I'll try to maybe stick around for, for his stuff, is uh, uh, something that is not too widely adopted that's out there is Heap Canaries. Um, there are a couple implementations for that. Uh, Contra Police is, uh, is one attempt. The, the OpenBSD stuff has the G option to mallet conf, and that's not enabled by default because it breaks a lot of stuff. But what this does is apply the same thing to the Heap. So in talking about you know, the heap as another vector for this stuff, what they do is place the kind of the same thing, canary values, guard values, at, at sort of the, the beginning and the end of, of the memory allocation. So, and then uh, WKR, I wish I knew his initials, uh, but uh, he has, uh, this is one of the guys from Shellfish a couple of years ago, um, and he has a, a, a heap guard implementation for DL malloc. Now the thing that he says on his site is that he's discontinued development because it's supposed to be integrated into DL Malik. So that's why I'm kind of curious about Atlas's stuff because, um, from what I could tell, it wasn't yet in DL Malik. So um, maybe uh, maybe it, it's not actually out there yet, or maybe it's totally irrelevant. So that's why, that's why I'm going to stick around anyway. So the main thing about canaries was that uh, if the uh, canary is the, is the only element to protect against corruption in memory, it's, the defense simply becomes sort of as good as a canary value. So uh, Gerardo Richard, a core set guy, uh, he had a paper on a lot of different methods to defeat, uh, specifically stack guard and stack shield and some of these other things. And basically what he was talking about is if, if uh, other addresses aren't protected um, or if you can find ways to, to overwrite things like stack frame pointers, other places in memory, um, it's, it becomes a, a way to, to defeat it. Um, Bulb and Killer have a, uh, there's a, a frack paper from a while ago that was uh, specifically pointing out probably the fatal flaw in StackGuard, which is that it just protects the return address. So 
they uh, they found that uh, because of that, you know, you could write pointers in other places. You could write over other areas on the stack, and it, it, you know, you were just sort of doing what was the most common method to exploit stack-based overflows, which is to overwrite the RTA. But it's not the only way. So. Another thing is you know, the canary is somewhere in memory. If you can read that canary value somehow, that may be of a, a value. Um, there are some methods to to uh, kind of keep it off stack. And so things like format string bugs, prop, proc mem, and things, these info, some kind of info leakage might give you a way to disclose that. So, and this is what, um, especially Vista, there's a lot of hype about, there's a lot of discussion about with Vista is, uh, you know, if, uh, if you look at most exploits, they target kind of known addresses. So if you look at exploit code, they'll have, you know, this is, this is uh, you know, if you ever run exploits, nobody does that around here and stuff. You'll see, um, you know, this is the Red Hat version. This is, you know, for Fedora Core 5. This is for whatever. Well, it's pointing to specific addresses in memory. So with uh, address-based layout randomization, or ASLR, what you're doing is you're randomizing that stuff. Um, PAX is... Uh, really probably the first people to come up with this, I think. Um, I think there's a little bit of finger pointing and stuff, but uh, uh, they have probably the most robust implementation of ASLR out there. Uh, so you randomize user land, case stack, um, MMAP calls, things like that. So then I like about PAX is it has a lot of tunable bits, so you can flip things kind of on and off. Um, and uh, also CH PAX or PAX control lets you do that on a per binary basis, so it's more tunable. Um, when you look at the stuff that OpenBSD does, it's all kind of turned on, and that's what you get. So if it breaks things, sorry. You know, uh, There are some similar bits for NetBSD and FreeBSD, and I actually got some slides on that later um, if you're interested in checking that out on other uh, platforms. ExecShield is Red Hat's implementation. Uh, it does some stack randomization, things like that. I don't know why they didn't just use PAX. Um, it was out there. It was already pretty widely supported, and instead they, they sort of decided to build their own thing. Um, so that it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I think it's one of the problems with the open source world sometimes is that, especially the sort of corporatized open source, is that even though there's things in the community, people will still develop it open source, but they'll still do their own thing. So that they can say this is you know controlled by a Red Hat developer. So Vista adds a, a random XE and DLL loader, uh, varying degrees of entropy and randomization. Uh, PAX, OpenBSD, some of these have a lot better randomization than Vista. Um, for apps to utilize this internally, there are some compiler flags that have to be passed to it. Um, I was talking to a guy from MS uh, the other the couple days ago, and he was talking about how much he really hated uh, the slash dynamic base flag because it makes um, crash dumps really hard for them to understand. And I think there's like some developer backlash about it. But uh, in order to to really take advantage of this stuff, that's you have to pass flags to the compiler. Um, Ollie Whitehouse did a talk a little while ago, uh, talking about some of the weaknesses on the heap, um, heap addresses, and the heap randomization in Vista is much more predictable uh, than maybe it should be. And I think there's some discussion that they're going to probably correct it in a, a couple of revs. So position-independent executables are a way to uh, to take advantage of some of the ASLR stuff. In a, in a given exe, and that's kind of required to really take advantage of ASLR fully. So, if DLLs and libraries are randomized, that helps, but it doesn't it doesn't get you sort of all the way there unless you're building things that are fully uh, position independent themselves. And so, basically, they find the global offset table, they go somewhere random, and so at each run, uh, a given exe, it's it's sort of less predictable. Um, John Moser is a guy who's been trying to get a lot of this stuff integrated into Ubuntu. He has made a little progress, probably not as much as he would like. Uh, but he just a, you know his guesstimate is that if you take stack random bits and MMAP random bits, uh, you know it's a uh, one and two to the power two to the power of that to uh, predict an address. So you're relying on randomization to make these things a little tougher to exploit. Uh, pick pi, dynamic base. You know, all of these things are, like say, they're kind of key to a full-blown ASLR uh, implementation. If you don't have, if you don't have uh, position-independent executables, the ASLR by itself doesn't really do you a whole lot of good, or at least as much as it would with, with both bits. So on ASLR, basically what we ended up with was the, uh, the randomization itself becomes kind of the, the key sort of factor. So somebody that I thought was really interesting is uh, a 
a guy named Hovav Shakam, um, and he's an Israeli cryptographer who looked at this stuff and said, well, hey, wait a minute, this is bad crypto, right? You know, this is just kind of, you know, weak crypto. So what uh, he did a paper on PAX on a 32-bit platform, so this is a while ago. Uh, but uh, what he did was build a Apache that was vulnerable to, uh, you know, a couple different things, but what he did was attempt to do a return of libc on that and guess try to guess the offset of uh, the system call and what he found is that an aslr protected apache he could uh, he could exploit that in about 200 seconds um, the problem is that apache restarts respawns um, every time that it loads so if it crashes you know, typically when you're when you're taking advantage of uh, buffer overflow you're crashing a service so if it restarts every time then you can continue to you continue to keep trying until you guess the correct address. Um, in somebody tells me in Vista, they I think they do three failed uh, st three failed startups like you know service restarts three times and then it stops. Um, and uh, GRSec, which is some uh, other technology that integrates a lot with PAX, uh, they have some bits to do that to do the same kind of thing. So if a service crashes uh, in memory, it'll it'll rest it'll restart X number of times and then after that you stop. So that sort of makes this a little more difficult. And I think actually with GRSec they uh, they pause like X number of seconds again. So that kind of makes this a little harder to brute force. But like I said, I, th I think what was kind of neat about this guy was he sort of looked at this as like like I say kind of a weak crypto system and pointed out some of the problems with it. Um, he has a, n a paper that just came out that uh, I'm just going to point out because I thought it was pretty interesting. It's uh, a uh, look at a way to do return to libc with no function calls. So he has this, if you go out, just Google for like Hovav Shakam, I think it's hovav.net is his uh, domain. Uh, he just published this a little while ago. Uh, what he does is he, I'll call you back. Um, what he does is uh, scan through loaded libraries and come up with a series of what he calls gadgets, which are little bits of, of code that do different things, and then kind of chains them all together, ties them all together, to, to end up doing execution without actually calling like a function. And so he has a method to scan memory for all these pieces. And so it's it's not really specific to stack protection, it's just kind of interesting because I've, I've never seen anybody um, come up with an approach like that. Uh, and it's kind of a whole different problem from some of this stuff. Um, Something else that uh, they just that sort of occurred to me in looking at this stuff is that uh, Shockham, you know, on the heap in Vista, you have weak randomization. Um, when you're looking at something that's like a client side exploit, where potentially you can restart as many times as you want, um, something that's browser based, for example, you could just keep starting over, starting over. Um, in, say, something in the JavaScript that's in a, in a browser, well, you know, if you're looking at weak, like say Vista having pretty weak randomization on the heap, it would seem like maybe this would apply. Ben Hawks uh, did a talk at, Rusk, at uh, RuxCon a little while ago, um, and he uh, talked about a method called code access brute forcing. Uh, so what he does is uh, use a series of sort of unsuccessful reads. So again, in uh, ASLR being mostly a method to protect against return to libc, preloaded functions in memory have sort of it's, you don't know where it starts and ends, but it's still the same size. So like the system call is kind of roughly the same size on a given platform. So if you can kind of poke around, eventually you can infer that address. So um, he actually did a bunch of work against uh, OpenBSD and, and uh, looked at that. And also things that pre-link uh, will potentially give you ability to, uh, to guess some of those locations as well. Uh, Ollie Whitehouse, uh, I mentioned him a couple of times. He did a talk at, uh, actually at Black Hat DC and uh, he did it here in Vegas as well. Uh, it's out there because it was at Black Hat DC, you can get it on the site. So it's out, it's out at the Black Hat site. Um, and he did a, a bunch of series of kind of regression tests against Windows Vista and looked at how efficient the randomization is. And he found, the, probably the most interesting thing that he found was that when you use the, the standard C uh, Improtect, or uh, sorry, MMAP call, uh, MS has like their own, uh, and he found that when you use the, the, the uh, ANSI C one, it had better randomization than when you used MS's own re recommended call. So I thought that was kind of funny. But uh, what, he, uh, what he found was that the randomization was substantially more predictable, and he's got these really neat visualizations of it that make it really kind of easy to understand because you can see this kind of sort of mostly flat line 
as he went through and, and uh, did what he did was do a series of like hundreds of reboots on a Vista box and then look at the addresses and then map them out. And so what he found is that, like say, the crypto there is not so great. So sort of exploit mitigation cliff notes, uh, like say, no exec, no exec stacks in NX. Um, if they're configurable at runtime, they're pretty useless. There's lots of other ways. Uh, so in and of itself, it's, it's just about worthless. Um, Dave Maynard called it a speed bump a couple of years ago. I think that's pretty accurate. ASLR bad crypto is not a panacea by itself. Um, memory leak bugs and things will allow you to, to find other ways. Um, again, Canaries, bad crypto is not a panacea. So um, all rights to memory space require protection, and I think that was the lesson from StackCard, was that just a couple of addresses doesn't do you that much good. Um, the best practice today, so this is, so like all these kind of have flaws, right? But basically what the consensus seems to be, right? Uh, Schneier says uh, security in depth, you know, the, uh, the aggregate of a series of imperfect controls is a better control. Right, that's the hope. So you know, the mesh model is another another sort of expression of that. Uh, it's a, a combination of all kinds of different features that maybe may not work so great in and of it of themselves, but hopefully the aggregate of all of these together um, gives us some modicum of safety. Um, and what I can say, again, you know, this being just sort of my attempt to understand this stuff, is that a lot of really smart guys. Uh, so, you know, go, go by the immunity booth and talk to Dave Vitel because they're really cool guys in general. And, you know, he says, hey, this stuff is pretty tough to hit. Um, well, actually, we'll get to this in a little bit. Like, what seems to be the main problem now is inconsistency and sort of problems that different pieces of software have in implementing all these uh, and some of the ability to opt out of these things. But sort of the aggregate of all this stuff. So you've got address-based randomization. You've got a pretty consistent no-executable stack. And uh, you've got some kind of canary method to check for overwrites and corruption in memory. Like the aggregate of all this stuff is you're in a pretty good spot. And like I say, that, that seems to be the consensus is that you have, if you have all of these things and they're turned on consistently and it's turned on in all, all, of, uh, all of your code and it's all built that way, potentially what you'll get, this is the hope, right, is that if you're running vulnerable code and you don't know about it, uh, because we don't, unless somebody else has a lot more time than I do, uh, we don't read every line of every single piece of code we run. Uh, it's not possible unless you do one thing or unless you sleep a lot less than I do, and I don't sleep a lot anyway. So uh, the intent of all this stuff is that we'll have some level of protection against these things and give a way to kind of contain this stuff. So 19 years later, we're just kind of getting a handle on this. So what else can we do to raise the bar? Um, static code analysis, um, something that, especially if you run open source stuff, something you, you probably ought to know about is the uh, fortify source bits for GCC. Um, dash D fortify source equals two will actually replace dangerous function calls and things like that and look for mistakes. And actually the one thing I found was format string bugs, uh, which are not that common anymore from what I understand, but when they are out there, they're pretty ugly stuff um, because they sort of allow arbitrary reads and writes to memory, things like that. Uh, dash D fortify source equals two will actually catch some of that stuff in compile time. So that's pretty cool. Um, the Coverity project, in, in, uh, which was a, a project that was funded by DHS, uh, went through and did static source analysis with, obviously, Coverity's uh, commercial source code review product that they want to you know, promote. They got uh, a contract with, with the Department of Homeland Security to go through and perform static code analysis on sort of every major open source project. So they went through uh, Apache and uh, you know, Bind, SendMail, lots of other things. Um, something kind of uh, that I thought was pretty sharp was uh, Ben Laurie uh, pointed out that it's really nice of the Department of Homeland Security to pay a commercial company to find bugs in open source code. It'd be even nicer if they paid open source developers to fix them. Uh, so what you're finding is a lot of a lot of this stuff, and then they're not disclosing it. They're working with the with the particular project teams to to address it. But you know, then they have to have their resources to deal with all the bugs that are found. Um, sort of a, a limitation of static code analysis. Obviously, the the single best way to find any given bug is, is to actually do source code review by a human being 
you know, line by line. And yeah, and there's of course discussion about things like fuzzing, all this other stuff. But uh, you know, Rice's theorem says that for I guess for a given problem set, you know, there's there's a if if it has x number of answers, you know, it's it's not predictable. Uh, you can't fully uh, fully predict the uh, yeah. I actually suck at Rice's theorem. I'm going to drop that. But uh, what uh, made more sense to me for it was what I call Rumsfeld's corollary, which is there's known knowns, there's known unknowns, and we and there's unknown unknowns. So we know what we know, we know what we don't know, but we don't know what we don't know. We don't know. So you know, and that's when you're doing static code review and things, that's kind of the deal. You, you hope that some of this stuff will, will find all these things, but you don't know for sure. Um, one of the other things that, that sort of comes into this stuff is access control models. Um, it's not really a method to, to actually stop uh, memory corruption vulnerabilities, but it is a, a way to sort of do containment. So you have things like RSPAC, GR Security, AppArmor, SE Linux, and there's a lot of contention in Linux about which is the best and what access control model everybody wants to do. I'm just going to say and try to be agnostic and say they all have varying degrees of complexity. And I won't mention which one is the most complex. I think other people probably, if you've touched any of this stuff, you can guess. Um, but there are, there are lots of solutions out there that allow you to contain um, what applications can do um, and contain where they can read, write, uh, and sort of even if you have exploitation of a given vulnerability, maybe you can't kind of find access to other areas of memory or other areas of the file system, things like that. MS has a, a access control, what they call mandatory integrity control model in Vista. Uh, this is the thing you click allow, 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 allow on uh, when it pops up. Uh, so, and then Big Iron Unix, you have Trusted Solaris, and HPEX has a C2 trusted mode. These are sort of other ways to kind of, like, say, contain execution based on, I mean, contain uh, file permissions and things like that based on user ID. And then Little Iron Unix, you know, uh, Trusted BSD, which is part of uh, FreeBSD from 5 up. And then I actually, I guess, should mention that OpenBSD has the, uh, the SysTrace stuff, which is some other ways to, uh, to control what applications can and can't do. Mac has Mac now. Um, apparently, it's it's actually part of Leopard. Uh, it was I didn't find a lot of docs on it. It was announced that at the WWDC uh, that it was going to be integrated, and uh, then there's there's if you check on Apple's site, there's like no docs. So if anybody's got docs on how to do this stuff in Leopard, um, you know, let me know. Uh, there's some of that was an offshoot of a project called SE Darwin, which is an attempt to um, kind of include some of the SE Linux features and the uh, trusted BSD features into, uh, into Darwin. OpenBSD is, uh, as I think probably most people know, done a lot of work with ProPolis, WXRX. Uh, they, they've uh, got a lot of other things. One of the things that the OpenBSD guys uh, ran into a lot of debate with the PAX people about is uh, M the mProtect function call, um, which, like I say, allows you to kind of say, this, this check of memory sort of opts out of the model. Um, their, their belief is that breaks POSIX compliance, and that's all well and good, but I like the fact that uh, with PAX and GRSEC, I can turn it off. That's, you know, I'd like the option to say, no, I don't want that, even if it breaks some of my stuff. Um, uh, kernel randomization is, uh, from what I understand, not there. If somebody wants to tell me I'm wrong, go for it. Um, but uh, recently, you've seen a lot of sort of kernel-based vulnerabilities in OpenBSD, and I think that's probably a factor. Uh, PAX does do uh, some randomization of the kernel stack. FreeBSD, uh, there are some ports of some of the, the OpenBSD stuff to FreeBSD. So uh, just Google for like um, SSP FreeBSD, and there's a this guy, two URLs out there. I'll have this, the slides out um, pretty soon. Sorry, they're not on the CD. Um, but uh, this guy's ported some of this stuff to FreeBSD. Um, if you're not doing that and you're running FreeBSD, all you're getting is sort of very rudimentary no exec stack, and that's a um, the NetBSD guys have been pretty active on some of this, and they, they really have been looking at packs and, and trying to kind of add some of these features into NetBSD. So with Linux, um, you know, with the integration of Propolis into GCC 4.1, kind of everybody has some bits of this. Um, the Ubuntu guys, uh, there is a there's a, a offshoot of Ubuntu called Ubuntu Hard, and there have been a, a couple different Linux distributions that have been centered on some of this stuff. Um, the uh, the Munich guys, um, the 
excuse me, Adamantix guys that were working on some of these bits for uh, for Debian. Uh, but the two that are most active that are actually doing a lot of this stuff uh, are the Harden Gen 2 project and, uh, like I say, Ubuntu Harden. Uh, they've been sort of trying to move some of the stuff. And you go out to the Ubuntu site, they have something called the Ubuntu Security Roadmap that talks a lot about this stuff. And actually, for me, that's probably where I got most interested in this was just kind of reading through a guy named John Richard Moser who's thinking about a lot of this stuff for Ubuntu. Um, like I say, in GCC, everybody has at least the ProPolice stuff, but if you look through the uh, bug reports for most of the Linux distributions, you'll see a lot of stuff about, hey, this broke my code, so I did FNO stack protector all. So I just turned it off because, you know, something broke. Um, so actually what I will say is that that is one thing that, that uh, the OpenBSD guys are pretty, imp pretty impressive to me about is they've kind of said, you know, no, we're going we're gonna to make this work, sorry. So, that, you know, that's pre it's pretty cool. Um, Vista, the least explosive Ford Pinto ever. Uh, so, you know, they, they've, they've made a lot of progress. Um, you know, I, I guess what I would say is they sit where some of the security-centric open source projects were about O2. You know, so that, I mean, that's really, that's pretty cool when you consider that they're a commodity operating system that everybody, you know, they have to support thousands of different closed source applications that run on their platforms, right? Um, so they have ASLR, they have some basic position independent executable stuff. Um, the biggest problem they seem to have is the consistency. So there have been a number of Windows-based vulnerabilities where um, you've seen things where people went through it and said, well, wait a minute, you know, why didn't this, why didn't this get taken care of? And, and uh, it's been because it was compiled with different versions that, of Visual Studio that didn't have all the same bits or, you know, the, uh, the, also, like I say, the ability on a sort of software basis to opt out of some of this stuff to me, I think is part of their problem. Um, something you, you may want to check out if you're interested in this stuff is uh, these guys, Wainus, um, make an app or in a series of sort of binary drivers that allow you to have some uh, ASLR for 2003 and XP. Uh, which is not something you really get. Basically, 2003 and XP, you basically just got kind of some of the GS stuff and a rudimentary sort of no exec stack. OS X, think obscurity. So 3% of the market share means that we're absolutely rock solid and unbreakable. It's true. Um, you get a no exec stack in the kernel because they deal, a lot of their stuff kind of ties into FreeBSD stuff and Darwin is, is coming for some of that. So you have basic no exec stack, that's it. No ASLR, uh, no pick, no pie. Um, you know, I, I think that Apple is gonna continue to have a problem with this until they really sort of take this stuff seriously. Um, right now, like I say, it's more about not being a very visible target. I think that that is why they can say they're so rock solid. So, belt, suspenders, you know, kind of both. Um, every defensive measure, you know, can be defeated in a vacuum. And basically, um, the reason that I got interested in this was that uh, all the material that I could find was either written by somebody who talked to, and actually, let me say, with one exception, if you go to the PAC site, those guys have this stuff very well documented. Um, there is, there's a lot of really great docs out there of just going through how this stuff works. And so if you want to start somewhere to understand it, whether you run PACs or, or don't, go check that out because it's pretty cool. But, um, you know, most of the things that I found either talk, they were either written by somebody who wrote a defensive mechanism and said how unbreakable it was, or somebody who wrote, uh, or came up with a method to defeat that mechanism and sat, said how there was no way around what they came up with. So this is kind of trying to kind of look at both sides. Uh, you know, volnprog.c will always get owned. Um, one other piece that you should check out is uh, PaxTest and Vistaprobe. They're available for um, PaxTest, for example, is probably built on just about every platform. You can run this and kind of look at on your box, you know, what do you have turned on and how much of this stuff is there. Um, and then Vistaprobe actually was written for Vista to look at some of this stuff and, and it basically runs through like some simulated um, exploits to kind of gauge your, your how effective the m different measures are. So like, you know, stack execution with them protect without you know, stuff like that. And then it tries to predict how many bits of randomization you have for your libraries and executables. 
Um, so it'll tell you, you know, sort of where you sit. And uh, like I say, same, same for PAX tests. Uh, there's some debate about PAX tests on uh, other security platforms, you know, of is it sort of centric on PAX, but it, um, you know, it, it does, it is about the only thing out there that you can sort of as an average person run and, and get some idea of where you sit. Um, I have five minutes. Uh, let me say just real briefly the, the own the box, own the box thing. Um, you know, where that came from was that uh, I actually sort of wanted to find out not knowing how effective sort of really being able to say unequivocally myself, you know, how good is this stuff? Um, what uh, sort of I proposed originally to the DEF CON folks was that I was going to bring a box, plug it in the network, and build it with, uh, in my case, like Genji Harden and all the pack spits, and uh, put some services and some, app, some apps on there that are sort of old versions. Um, and then when they decided that that was something they would want to promote, I, I decided I didn't really want to make it about just me, so I sort of asked lots of other random people to do the same thing. Um, and so it actually, I guess, would, I would say if you've had any involvement with any of the people that have sort of glommed together and are working on it, it's kind of become more like the own the antique hardware project. So not a lot of people wanted to bring boxes to get owned at DEF CON. Um, I thought it was a good idea, I don't know. But uh, so if you're interested in like old Sun IPXs and like an old Next box and things and you have some, some stuff that'll work on that, like, you know, it's sitting out there. Um, what I will say about my stuff is that I brought, a, I brought a, actually a pretty nice piece of hardware um, running, in my case, like uh, 1.3.37 of Apache that should be vulnerable to the mod rewrite uh, overflow and, and OpenSSH, some other things. Um, I think really the, the reality is the people that are sharp enough to, um, to actually look at some other ways to get around some of the things that uh, I have turned on, probably not really interested in my like shitty $500 server. So, um, but if anybody, if anybody wants to talk about some of this stuff and tell me why I'm wrong, like, that's cool. Um, that's about it. Thanks guys, thanks for sitting through this, waiting for Atlas.